want to introduce to you this evening then our speaker this evening and I'm looking forward to hearing Dave because I got two different definitions of what you how you ended up in paradise so I definitely want to have you share were you there before the fire were you there after the fire etc okay so Anyhow, Dave owns Natural Beauty Tree Works and is a certified arborist. So he is going to share with us all about his experience with the huge big fire in Paradise, Northern California. So come on up. Everybody, can everybody hear me good? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. So like uh, Shirley said, my name is David McCulloch. I'm a certified arborist, and I'm also uh, on the board of directors at the Arizona Community Tree Council, which is a statewide nonprofit organization that continues and furthers everything to do with trees in our state, as necessary as they are for our existence. So as a certified arborist, Back last year in August, I received an email from a contractor stating that Pacific Gas and Electric, PG&E, uh, the huge power mogul out there in California, was looking for certified arborists. They were looking to hire at least 100 certified arborists from all over the U.S. to come out there. Why? Well, you know, in the last few years, California has fallen prey to some of the most ravaging wildfires. And in the last three or four years, they have become more numerous and more deadly, these wildfires. So some of these fires were caused by limbs that fall off of trees. Now, if a limb just falls on one of the conductor lines, no problem. When a branch of a tree or a limb falls and it falls over, and it connects two conductor lines, touching both, ignition is possible at that point. So, some of the fires that happened in the last few years, namely the car fire up in Redding, and then another fire in San, uh, Santa Rosa, those were both caused by limbs hitting the conductor lines from Pacific Gas and Electric's uh, conductors. So, they hired us arborists to come out there. I'm going to pass this around. Okay. There's something on both sides. Do you want to start yeah. with you? And this as well. This was uh, what we would hang on the doors. Basically what we did is we were going through the Oakland Hills and then we moved up to Rohnert Park, Santa Rosa, and then to Redding. And what our job was as an arborist was to walk along the power lines 7,000 miles of power lines they had in, in the tier three threat area. That's what their main concern was, this tier three threat area. So we were to walk along these power lines and walk about 50 feet in, looking at all the trees, seeing if we had a tree with rot in it and tree leaning that was dead. Also, we had to look. This power lines Basically, it's 12 feet out from each conductor, ground to sky. Make sure that area is totally clear and that all the other trees that are, and that could fall in are healthy and strong. If not, we had to mark those on a little digital app on our phone. We had to stand right next to it and drop a little dot on the Google Maps. So then we would create a work order. This work order would then go to the tree, tree uh, crews, and then the tree crews would come out and they would take down all those trees or they would prune them if they needed to be pruned, whatever. Well, as those jobs started to get done and we started to have more and more jobs completed, they opened another position called auditor. And that's the position that I was moved into, me and one other friend or associate of mine. So I was now an auditor. What does that mean? It means that I would now go out to the completed tree jobs and we would inspect to make sure that everything that was prescribed on the work order was completed as it was prescribed. So that's where my 
intersection with Paradise comes in. Because at that point we were in Santa Rosa. They sent me and my buddy James over to Yuba City and we would then go from Yuba City up to Paradise and Megalia. And this is before the fire. Driving up into Paradise every day, inspecting these completed tree jobs. I was amazed when I drove up into Paradise because the road that takes you to Paradise is called Skyway Boulevard. Skyway is a, a road that is just like, exactly like the 87 coming up from Rye. I mean, it, you, you would think that, and, and I thought to myself, wow, this feels like going back to Payson. Going up the skyline, uh, Skyway Boulevard, right up, just like going up from Rye into Payson, and then you come down into Paradise, and there's nothing but ponderosa pines and incense cedars. Of course, they're twice as tall out there. They're almost 200 feet tall, ponderosa pines. Imagine the ones we have out here, 90 feet, you know, at, at tops, 100 feet. 200 feet tall, and incense cedars, another tree, uh, and DFR cedars, a couple of other trees, redwoods, um, but very much like Payson. We drove into that town, and I was like, wow, we're doing these tree inspections on these completed tree jobs, and I'm just like, these people don't know anything about Firewise. I said, look at how thick this is. I mean, you couldn't run through anyone's backyard. I mean, of course, they have a backyard, maybe 10, 15, 20 feet, but beyond that, you couldn't run through the woods. I mean, you, you couldn't even move. It was so thick. And I was like, man, if this place ever caught on fire, it would, it would be a nightmare. I remember saying that to my buddy. I said, man, these people don't know nothing about firewise. They don't even know the word exists. So we're doing these jobs, and then at the end of the day, we're driving back through Megalia and then back through Paradise. And we're like, oh, that's a cool place to go eat. Let's go eat breakfast there tomorrow. All right, that's a great place to maybe grab a beer when we get done working one day. You know, we're seeing all these neat places to stop uh, in Paradise. And then we got back to the hotel after three or four days of working up there. And they said, you guys are being moved up to Reading. So we packed up our stuff, drove up to Reading, started doing some work up there. Two days later, the fire in Paradise broke out. We're sitting there in, the re in, in Reading at the Best Western in the morning looking at the fire as it's going. Right as soon as we're sitting there watching it, we all get emails on our phone that we're now all arborists are being deployed to the base camp in, uh, in Chico. So we packed up all our stuff. We were so excited because we finally got a good hotel with a good breakfast every morning. And here we go. You're being deployed to the base camp in Paradise. So we drive there. There's all these highway patrolmen and sheriffs and everything. And we're all let through. The arborists are let through. We get them in, get them into the base camp. And we pull into this base camp. The smoke is just, you can't even see. I couldn't see you from here in that smoke. It was so thick. And they give us a little N95 respirator, which if you know what those are, they're just junk. So they give those to us, and then they say, here's where your accommodations are. And there's these semi-trailers. And in the semi-trailer, when you go in, there's a little narrow hallway down the middle. There's a bunk on the bottom, bunk in the middle, bunk on the top. Ten of those on each side. Sixty people. One semi-trailer. You get in bed, it's a nightmare. There's no ladders or anything. You have to figure out a way to get in there. And you basically, you have like this much room. And you have to sleep there. Uh, it, was, it was unbelievable. But uh, so we get there, and our job as arborists then, because PG&E had us out there already inspecting these trees along the power lines. So... They had to have the arborists go in before anyone else, before the linemen, before they could put up new, new power poles, before forensic anthropologists could come there. Even some of the law enforcement and first responders couldn't get in there. Why? Because these 200 foot tall trees are burned out, everything except for an inch of the outer and inner bark of the tree. So you have a 200 foot tall missile that only has an inch of wood holding it on. And as soon as the wind blows, there goes another tree. And these trees are just coming down. And so nobody could go anywhere until they get these arborists in there to walk along the roads and inspect all the trees. And if there was a tree that was a hazard, that it was an imminent threat, we had to mark it P1 with spray paint, and then we had to stand there and call our lead and tell them, 
we've got a P1 out here, and they sent the tree crew immediately comes out, and the tree crew comes out, they take the tree down, and then I can go on and, and inspect more. Once that was done, that was after the fire burned out. Then yeah, the fire went through Paradise in one day, and it, and it was gone. Yeah, this weekend I spoke up in Par uh, up in Pine at the Firewise Day uh, on Saturday, and amazingly, the Pine Strawberry Fire Department has this really cool simulator, and it's all made of sand. It, it's it's a big box made of sand. You seen it? Yeah. And and he actually said. Come here and I'll show you the Paradise Fire, the campfire. And he, he put in some numbers and buttons and pressed this and that. And all of a sudden, he said, this is where the fire started. And it shows exactly the topography and everything. And it showed right where the fire started and how it just started growing and how it just enveloped. And it came around Paradise and it just swallowed it up and then moved on, uh, moved on out east. And uh, it was really great to be able to see that because uh, we were there the day after the fire had moved out of Paradise, but the fire was still burning. And the entire town, like I said, was full of smoke. I have videos on my phone of me driving down Main Street. Of course, I'd get a ticket now for having my phone. Uh, but there was nobody in the town, so I was driving along and driving along Main Street. And it's just unbelievable, every business. Uh, I'm going to pass around some pictures now. These pictures are from my own... Uh, cell phone and basically what happened is every day or every night after we were done working we would go into chico and we'd go to a different restaurant or a different place well one of the nights we went into the sierra nevada brewing company there that's where they're from is chico we're in there talking with some of these people and of course everybody is a buzz about the fire you know that's going on and everybody from paradise is all in chico crammed in there trying to to stay alive in the Walmart parking lot or hotels and everything was sold out. So when, when we were there, these customers would know that, oh, you're part of the team that's going up into paradise every day. And they were like, could you please, please check my address. Could you please check my address? And they give me their email or they give me their phone number and then they give me the address. So my little mission of mercy that I did up there was every day on my lunch break in Paradise when I was in the town. Everybody else is hanging out and they're eating their lunch. Well, I'd get in my car, my truck, and I'd bomb around and GPS these addresses for these people. You know, because they were in my house. I don't know if it's, it's there or not. So they would give me their address. I would go on my lunch break and I would go to that address and I'd take a picture of the mailbox and then I'd take a picture of the house. And I thought maybe by the end of my time there, doing four or five of these every lunch, every, every time I had lunch, I'd be able to bring somebody some good news. But every single house, every single one that I checked on was destroyed. To the ground, nothing left. Pools of aluminum on the ground where the engine block melted. So hot as fire burned, a football field, it moved at, at a speed of a football field per second. If you can imagine that, I can't even fathom how fast that is so if you're seeing some of the pictures around there this is because they didn't firewise clear this town this town got was devastated some of the trees because the incense cedars and the redwoods uh, and the uh, ponderosa pines have very thick bark so our job was to check the cambium layer of the tree with a hatchet so we have to take off the bark, get down to the cambium, and see if the cambium layer was moist or not. If it was dry, then we had to spray paint it, remove, take it out. Because it wasn't going to come back, it was dead. And then if they were good, we just left them alone. But that was our time in paradise, is inspecting all of these trees throughout the entire town. And these people, had they firewise cleared their property, uh, this fire wouldn't have moved as fast as it did, and it wouldn't have moved, uh, it wouldn't have been so devastating because it, it burned so low because of all the brush. The trees are still standing, as you'll see in some of these pictures. The trees, some of them didn't even get phased. You know, some of them burnt out completely, but the most part, a lot of the trees were fine, but the houses were completely decimated. I mean, they said they couldn't find and they didn't find any, any bones of the people who had passed away, 85 people. They didn't find one bone. They said they only found bone fragments. It burned so hot, it cremated these people. It's just unbelievable to think. So what 
is FireWise? So FireWise basically is thinning out our areas on our properties. Yeah? What was your wind speed for that park? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I'm sure you could look it up online uh, because we weren't there the day of the fire. We got there the day after. But that, that wind was definitely uh, a factor in, in how fast it moved. I'm not sure exactly how fast, but it was definitely a factor. But I'm sure you could, uh, you could probably Google that and find out um, just how fast the wind was on the day of the fire. So we got there. We worked three days in the smoke. All of us got sick. And the fourth day, it's just incredible, the fourth day, it started raining and it just came down. And they were trying to put this fire out for days. You know, they, they were working on it and they couldn't get it to get it, we couldn't get it out. It rained straight for a day and a half, solid just sheets of rain and put that fire completely out. Yeah, it was amazing. It was just amazing to see the power. You know, it's like all you little humans down there running around trying to stop this fire, watch this, and just little pinky, little pinky, put the fire completely out. Then the air cleared up, so we were all thankful for that. We'd take the respirators off. It wasn't mandatory anymore to wear them. They upgraded us to some next kind of, uh, some strange kind of respirator after we complained about the first one. So uh, the fire was out, but our job wasn't done. We still you know, had to go through and do that work. I did the work until uh, almost the end of December, came back here, and the Pace and Roundup, I don't know how many of you guys saw the article in December about Arborist. Uh, they, they put me on the front page because I saw so many similarities between Payson and Paradise. So the first, first thing is the road coming up, the B-line. Just like Skyway Boulevard, there's this road that just goes right up to the town. That's the first thing. The second thing is, in Paradise, there's only that one road that goes north and south, and there's one other road that goes out east. Exactly like us. And the main problem in that fire was they didn't have escape routes, and nobody knew where to go, and so it was just a big cluster, and nobody could move anywhere, and everybody was seeing, you'll see some of the videos online of the fire, and it's all backed up, and people can't get anywhere. I remember talking to a couple at the, uh, Sierra Nevada Brewery that night, and she said that her husband, the guy was right there, her husband and wife, but husband was working down in Chico that day, so he was already out of there. The mother was working in Paradise when she got the call to evacuate. Her son was at school. Her son got in his car, went home, grabbed the bag of stuff that the family, like the best, uh, most precious stuff the family has, I guess they had it all in a, in a, in a some kind of container, put it in his car and started driving down Skyway Boulevard and the fire state came right at him. And the fire was just, just moving so fast. He stopped in the middle of the road and started running east and a sheriff picked him up and he got out of there. He got out of the car? Yeah, yeah, he got out of the car and he just started running. I mean, you, this wall of fire coming at you, what are you going to do? <laughs> I mean, I would have took the car, maybe, but he didn't know what to do. I guess maybe he was surrounded or something, but he jumped out of the car and just started running down the road, and the sheriff picked him up. So, so that was a good, a good ending, one of the few good endings to that story. But uh, uh, So Payson has a north exit, a south exit, and an eastern exit. We have nothing west. So we're limited. The need for FireWise is great. Um, it's really, really uh, important, especially when you look at these pictures that I'm passing around and think about your own house. Think about going back to your own house right here where you live and seeing that right there. Now, it's not that expensive to FireWise when you look at what the cost is otherwise. The fire department has told me many occasions we come across a house, there's a wildfire here in Payson, and the fire is moving in a direction towards a house. If that house has been firewised, he said, I'll send my guys in, and they'll try to save the house because they have, they have a good chance because it's cleaned and there's not a lot of fuel. He said, I'll send my guys in there to do that. 
said, I come across a house where they neglected to do firewise. I said, we're going to stand back and I'll watch it burn. It's a harsh reality. So yeah, it's just a little bit. And it, you know what? It might cost even a couple thousand dollars to do the firewise, but you know what? The next year, it's like a couple hundred to just go in there and snip that little stuff. Because, I mean, we're taking out stuff that's this tall or, you know, scrubby oak that's this tall. I mean, you take that out, it's going to be years before it ever gets that big again. So you just have them come every year or every other year. And it's nothing once it's done. It's just the initial. Just the initial, and then the upkeep is nothing. You know, it's just like the snowball. Uh, so I'm going to pass around these pictures here of uh, Firewise. I'm going to start one. I've got three different sets. They're before and after. So the before picture is the one on top. And after, and you'll see that the trees, they look, you can tell that it's the same tree. This is before and after Firewise. And uh, it's incredible, the difference, because number one, Firewise is great for the trees. It's good for the trees because we take out the one to three inch runt trees that aren't going to get big. Why aren't they going to get big? Because they're living under the canopy of the forest and they're never going to get enough sunlight to become anything. So yeah, we see these cute little trees, you know, cute little pines and we're like, oh, it's so cute. But it's not going to become one of those beautiful pines, you know. And so we generally take out one to three inch runt, runt trees. We call them runts because they're never going to become any, anything viable. It's basically survival of the fittest when you do firewise. You leave the mature, strong trees. And so, so basic prescription for firewise is this. You have the canopy of a tree. You know where the canopy is? There's a drip line. The drip line is at the outer edge of the tree. So draw an imaginary line from the drip line of the tree so down to the ground and in a circle. Anything in that, anything in there needs to come out. No, no matter what it is, that has to come out. So underneath the canopy of the tree, there should be no fuel at all. Then you're gonna come into groves of scrubby oak. We, we, our company, we just take them out. We just take that scrubby oak out. Once in a while, you'll get a really good looking scrubby oak. And I know it's almost like an oxymoron. It's, but, but there are a couple nice ones. And so if I see a real nice one growing, we'll, we'll take out the stuff around it and we'll just leave that one. Um, manzanita, another big thing we have. Manzanita burns very hot. It burns really hot. And manzanita will take 100 gallons of water a day if it has it, if it's given it. It's unbelievable. So we take manzanita. Mostly man, a lot of manzanita runs horizontal along the ground. We always take those out. We'll, we'll take a huge, say we've got a 30-foot area, 20-foot area of manzanita. We'll reduce that down to a five-foot little area of manzanita. You still got a representative manzanita, it's pretty, but we reduce that all the way down to maybe a five-foot section and we pick the vertical ones, the ones that are growing up straight, uh, and we leave those. This is not under the canopy of a tree. Remember, if it's under the canopy of a tree, it's gone. So then we reduce those down, pretty much take most of the scrub oak out. Once in a while, if we see a good one, we'll leave it. And then the last thing is we'll go back, removing those one to three inch runt trees. We want to basically have trees 10 feet apart, but if they're older and they're mature and they're right next to each other, it's fine. Now people talk about, we take dead limbs off, lower dead limbs, but there is a little bit of a conflict between the fire department from the fire perspective and the arborist in the, ar the field of arboriculture. So the lower limbs on trees, when the water and the nutrients are taken up by the soil, it, from the soil, by the roots into the tree, it sends those vitamins, water, nutrients up into the leaves or the needles and they will lay out in the sun and they'll bake and they'll turn into sugar. Photosynthesis. Back in sixth grade, we all learned that. So when that carbohydrates and sugars are sent back down the tree after they're made by the leaves, the food factories, it goes back down and it is stored in the roots and it's stored in the lower limbs of the tree. So that is basically the basement 
you know, like we have a basement, we put all of our all of our stuff in the basement. Well, the tree takes all of its resources and puts them back into the roots and into the lower limbs of the tree. So cutting the lower limbs off a tree is not recommended, especially if it's a good, strong, fat limb. Lower live limbs or lower dead limbs? Dead limbs can always come off. Dead limbs always come off. But a live lower limb is very integral to the tree. And the fire, you know, the fire people, they don't have the education about what's going on inside a tree. Just like I don't have the education of what's how to wrap a hose and, and all of the stuff that they do. You know, it's just a matter of education. So what we do, if a lower limb is really a danger and a hazard, we'll go out and I'll make a heading cut. So a heading cut is basically if you have the limb and then another limb off of it, and then that limb continues, we'll take it off back. As long as the limb that you're cutting it back to is one third the diameter of the limb itself, it's okay to make that cut. And then six months later, we'll come back and we'll do another heading cut. And then ultimately what happens is the tree moves those resources out of that limb as, you, as it senses it's being cut. And it will vacate that limb and then you can end up taking that limb back. But it's a gradual thing. And it's, it's the only way to really do it so you don't wound your trees. Um, let's see. So basically what it is is why do we end up moving up here? You know, not to mention the valley. Somebody was saying earlier, we're paying these people, they should pay us 30 bucks to come up here and I'll be able to enjoy the beauty up here. But uh, we move up here from the cities and from anywhere because this is beautiful up here. I mean, we all live here because we were taken by the beauty of this area that we live in. And as, as I was saying earlier, this is, and we all here live in the Mogollon Rim. The Mogollon Rim is the largest ponderosa pine stand on the planet Earth. So we really are blessed in, in where we live. So we move here though because it's beautiful and because we like to be out in nature the thing that they don't tell you is that it comes with a price to move here, to be part of the people that live in what is called the wildland urban interface. The wildland urban interface is basically the joining together of human beings and forest. The forest has its own way of living. The forest has its own way of existing. And it exists with the possibility of fire. Some trees will only germinate their seeds by fire. It's the only way they'll open, some. So fire is a natural part of the wildland and the forest. It's a natural part of it, and it's something that we don't think about when we're selling our house in the valley and moving up here. The other thing we don't think about is the need to firewise clear our properties. There really should be, at every real estate office in Payson, there should be a big disclaimer. If you're gonna move here, you need to firewise your property because you are moving into an area where the threat and the reality of wildfire is common and it's part and parcel of the way the forest lives up here. How do we deal with that? We firewise our properties. And if everyone firewises, we're only as strong as our weakest link. So by everyone firewising, the, the neighborhood is solid. East Verde Estates have done a great job. They're a firewise community. Um, so just remember this as you go out and you talk to friends and people and people who are considering moving up here, remember that there is, uh, there's a responsibility of stewardship uh, for us all. If we wanna move up here and we wanna live up here, there's a price we have to pay and that is a small price and that's firewise clearing. So thank you very much. I'm gonna I'm gonna actually uh, open up for questions here in a minute. Uh, being an arborist, I brought um, 18 different brochures. So when I get done talking, if you just want to come up, it, and they're free for anyone. Uh, some of them are like a pamphlet on mature tree care. Ones on tree selection and placement, uh, pruning mature trees buying high quality trees, recognizing the tree risk. Why topping hurts trees? Don't ever top your trees. 
It's the worst thing you can do. I know we have great view here and we want to see the Mogollon Rim, but either take the tree out completely, but don't top it. And this explains why. What does top Topping means going up and just making a straight cut. Just cutting the top right out. Like It'll, APS does. Yeah, like, yeah, like APS does. What happens if you do that? Go well, ahead. when you top a tree, most times you're doing it in order to have a view, or in order to lower the height of the tree. Well, it's really a misnomer because as soon as you cut that, the tree sends a signal out and it will send shoots that will grow extremely fast. And you will have whatever feet, 15 feet that you cut down, it'll be back up there in, in six months to a year because the tree sends out immediately, uh, alert, alert, we need, more, we need more food factories, we just got cut. The other thing that it does is that it exposes all of the lower limbs that were shaded to all of a sudden full sun and it will scald those and then the tree will die. Nine times out of 10, I remember a, down in Phoenix, a lady topped a tree and I went by there and just told her, I said, you know, I'm, a, I'm an arborist and you don't want to cut that tree in half. I said, because you're exposing the bright hot sun to limbs that were otherwise completely shaded. And I said, you're going to be taking that tree out in six months to a year. And she's like, well, I had nah, 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 whatever. And sure enough, six months later, I remember seeing a tree company come and took the rest of the tree out because it died. So the tree also will never, ever regain its former glory and, and the way the maturity of these majestic trees. If you top it, it will never regain that beauty that it originally had, if it does live. If you covered this and I missed it, I apologize, but okay. one thing I haven't heard you say, which maybe is not part of an arborist's uh, field of dreams, but the thickness of trees, the number of trees per acre, a hundred years ago, compared to now, the same property has a hundred times as many trees in the same acre, and each tree takes water out of the soil, so the water going from up there to down there uh, is much less. So those are just a couple of things that I've learned is the thickness. And the, uh, our thickness is terrible up here, right? Well, I mean, no? being the largest ponderosa pine stand on the planet, yes, I mean, we, we do have very thick trees. They're nothing like the ponderosa pines out in California, uh, which are like two to three times as thick. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that being said, you're right. Originally, there was 60 to 70 pine ponderosa pines per acre. Now we have uh, upwards of six to 800 yeah. trees per acre, which is unbelievably thick. And it, but if you take a helicopter ride, you'll see that the thinning that they have done, what, what we do on a small scale firewise on our, in our yards, they have done out there by Geronimo Estates. And if you go on out towards Pine and, and above, it's unbelievable from a helicopter, the view that you get of the thinning that they did. And we're protected on, uh, on a couple of good fronts. There's a little bit more work we need to do on the, the big scale of something coming in. And they've done a great job, and they're still doing a great job. But us doing... Let me switch mine to So, what? Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, yeah. let's... Okay, we have rules okay. for our questions. Okay, uh, so here's uh, Glenn is first. And then, um, so who wants to, to work? We no. alternate. So then, um, well, but you already had a question. So you want me to you don't get all your questions in a row? We'll yeah, get, you want we'll to work this side we'll of the room? Okay, Barney's going to work that side of the room. Okay. Thank you for coming. How I'll did see. you deal with the Sierra Club and ruin the nesting grounds for a spotted owl and a black <laughs> mouse? Well, we actually didn't get to run into them, but but they burn out. But you're right. I mean, when we first went out there with PG&E, there was the environmental leads. So we had the tree worker leads, and we had our leads that we called when we saw a P1 tree that had to come out. We had to call that lead. Well, there was a, what's called an environmental lead, and she was always there at the trailer uh, at the base camp working because these riparian areas out in California, they have the little gray spotted uh, toad and a, and a little uh, salamander and certain things like that. And, they were very particular that we had to make sure and mark off these riparian areas 
because there, there's just so much regulation in California. Uh, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how much regulation is, you know, and there's a good, a good side to it because it's trying to preserve and some of the motives are good. Uh, but then again, there's, there's the bad side to it, you know, uh, which is, you know, just overkill. So one other quick thing, you would have improved your housing if you would have told them you're an illegal immigrant called the Border Patrol. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay, uh, back there we have... Yes, I got a question. Okay. You're here in town. What do we have to do to truck for a town? To get the town to take care of the land that the town owns. And it might be next door to somebody else's property. No, I moved. The town hasn't touched it. Yeah. It is so thick. It's a real fire hazard. Yeah, well, I mean, and we've got a lot of those. Yes, we do. And you're right. Yeah. Last year, we met at the fire station to put in bids, uh, three or four of us, the bigger, the bigger tree companies. Um, I got to be part because I was certified arborist, not because I have this huge company. But uh, um, I'm actually the only certified arborist in Rim Country right now. There is one who, Nelson, who works for the, the town who is a certified arborist, but he let his certification lapse. But anyway, that being said, uh, last year out in Tyler Parkway, they did a huge section of the area out there on the Tyler Parkway on the uh, north side as you're driving. They also did the area completely surrounding Rumsey Park, which was another bad area. They also had one other area that they did. So each year, they try to target a couple of these uh, problematic areas. So they're, they're not getting it done you know, fast enough, but they're making little progress, you know, slow but sure, each year. So I, I know as a fact you know, that they are targeting some of these areas you know, and, and trying to get them done. You know? But I don't know how we can, we can motivate them, but they are doing a little bit each year, so. Okay, here's Lee. Uh, I just wanted to let everybody know, I, I used to be on the board out here at the brush pit, and la I don't know about this year, but last year we actually had a Firewise uh, seminar when we opened the brush pit. I, d I think they did it this year too. I'm no longer on the board, so I don't, I don't know. But my question is, how do you keep uh, the trees that keep having suckers come out in the bottom? from coming out. Yeah. Well, that's called adventitious growth is what they call it in, in our industry. They're also commonly known suckers. When you see them on the branch, if there's a branch that's going horizontal and you see one going straight up, that's also a sucker, but it's on the tree, so it's called a water sprout. Those usually happen as a response, the tree's response to pruning, over pruning. They shoot those out. But if you're not pruning your tree and you're getting those, you just have to do it each year. You just got to get out there with your loppers and just, just prune them off. Because those are secondary and tertiary branches, which will never bear fruit. They'll never bear flowers. They're, they're just there to suck water up. That's what it hence suckers. They just take water. So it's a good idea to always do that. Actually, don't prune them in the spring. Wait till the start of summer because a lot of, another misnomer, and there's plenty of these in this industry, people say, oh, springtime, now's the time to prune your trees. No, the springtime is the worst time to prune your trees. Why? Because the cambium layer, which is the vascular system of the tree, is very active in the spring. When it wakes up from that winter dormancy, it's very active, pulling in water and nutrients, and it's very active, and so any pruning cuts that are made severely wound the tree in the spring flush of new growth. So don't prune your trees in the spring. Wait till right after spring, right when we get the hot summer, or right before December, you know. That's just a little, little nugget, little tip. Okay, we have Frank here. Uh, when is oh. the best time of year to plant fruit trees? Planting them, is the best time to plant them would be in the winter, in the, in the coldest months of the year. So when we have, when the ground is the hardest, I hate to say it, but you know, or you could also do fall, you know, you could do fall, but it's always best tra transplanting, planting, uh, structural pruning on fruit trees, dead of winter. Then 
once the structural pruning means the scaffolding and the branches and all of that, the structural part of the pruning. But once your fruit, like apples, <coughs> pears, peaches, plums, um, when, they're, when they're the size of, the, not the small marbles, but you know those, what are they called, snooker? Or s shooters. Shooters. Yeah, the, those bigger, fatter marbles. When your fruit is the size of those marbles, you want to go and separate your fruit. So what you do is you have all these clusters of peaches on this branch. Well, you go down the branch, you hit the first peach, take all the other ones off for four inches. So there's one piece of fruit, and then there's nothing for four inches. Then you prune everything off except one piece of fruit. You pick the nicest one. You take all the others off. Then you go another. Think I'm a little too close to something. So this way you're going to get big fruit, and you're going to get real tasty fruit. Separate your fruit four inches apart. So uh, it's tedious. Believe me, I've done it. But would you recommend potted or bare root? Uh, it's it's really hit or miss. I mean, the bare root has its own issues, but the bare root is good because you can plant that and not have to worry about girdled roots. The main thing that we have. And, uh, and I love Rob and Glenn at Plant Fair Nursery, and they know me real well. But container-grown plants always get these girdling roots. And if you don't straighten those out before you put them in the ground, they're going to keep girdling, and they'll girdle themselves, and it'll actually choke themselves to death. That's right. So, other questions? Barb over here. Barb. Yeah. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to talk with the realtor groups. Have you? No, I haven't. You, you need to talk to them because they're not real crazy about talking about Firewise to, to clients because they're afraid it's going to scare them off. So They'll lose the sale. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also, you need to talk to APS also. <laughs> Because they're real good with topping things off, but then they got to get it away from the wire. So I don't know what the solution is. To yeah, that. I know. Well, when it comes to power companies and having worked for PG&E out there sure. in California, sure. they got their own way of doing stuff, and their power—I mean, literally, their their power—is unbelievable. I mean, these people—it's just incredible. They can do whatever they want on your property. I mean, it's unbelievable. In Paradise, we're arborists, so a hundred of us are in Paradise, and we're on the side of the trees. We're not on the side of the people. Arborists are all about the trees. So somebody calls me up and says, I need you to come and take this ponderosa pine out. And I said, what's wrong with it? Looks really healthy to me. And they're like, well, I just don't like it. Sorry, I can't help you. You're gonna have to get somebody else, because there's no reason to take that tree out. It's perfectly fine. So. Right, there's Don back Don? there. Okay, got two Dons. Uh, what, uh, what would be the cost of the uh, same estimate to look at a property and decide what it's going to cost to fire was it? Uh, basically, right now we're moving into summer mode. Just did an estimate today 15 cents a square foot as far as, far as Natural Beauty Tree Works goes. Now, I'm a little bit higher than the average Joe out here because I am certified arborist, so when I touch your trees, their pruning cuts are made properly. Uh, your trees are going to live. And I, I pretty much tell everybody, once you have me there, you'll never have a landscape or a tree trimmer touch your trees again. Uh, is that 15 cents per square foot of the entire property, or only the areas that need to be as far ones? Well, that depends on how thick it is. And if I have to climb up hills and my workers have to drag brush up hills, and how far they have to get to where the trailer is. So, so if I get there and I see that it's all flat, and it's it's doesn't need much you know it's not real thick then the 15 cents a square foot minus the house or the building envelope but if the property is just thick and they've got to do some serious work then i just take the entire lot and, and it's 15 cents a square foot so that makes it, it and we live on the side of a canyon wall so. <laughs> oh my gosh so you need a helicopter to get the brush out yeah. <laughs> Well, if we can burn it, you know, we do that too. You know, the last couple properties we did were right up on the hill. If you know Mud Springs Road, where Mud Springs Road dead ends into the reservation hill, the hill that goes up the reservation, we just did two and a half acres on a hill like this. 
and thank God they let us burn. I mean, we had the hose, we stood there the whole way, the fire department came out, gave us a permit, and we burned all that brush, because it would have been, we would have been uh, half a mile to the trailer, you know, down the hill and through the property, through a little gate, grabbing brush. And it would have been Bef before you go, I, I would like to have your card. Absolutely, I do have cards up here, okay. and I have all these brochures. I want you guys to come up, take whichever ones you want. that are very scientific, uh, and, and we'll help you out for what you need. Don has a question. Don? Don over there. Dave. Yes. When you were in Paradise, did you get a chance to talk to anybody or did you see anything about the DEW weapons? DEW? Yeah, direct energy weapons? No. Did you hear anything about that? No, I mean, there was some talk about it, but um, there was some talk about the, 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 the high speed train and how all of the fires, uh, there's all these direct, theories. Yeah. But we were there when it happened and don't don't get on that bandwagon. Any other questions? Chick has a question. Yeah, I'm reading between the lines. Okay. But um, I've met people that work under contract for APS that walk the power lines underneath the power lines, cutting back brush and everything. And APS has a schedule to do that here. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say a hundred arborists had to go. No, PGE called 100 arborists to make an assessment. To me, that sounds like uh, PGS hasn't done their job. Oh, yeah. Exactly. And, and secondly, how, what you found in Paradise, how are those right of ways compared to the ones here? There's no comparison. I mean, you can't even get through the right of ways that were in Paradise. Now you can, you know. You know. <laughs> yeah. so, so they blew it. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And pg and &E, you know, this was a marketing move by them to save their own tail because they knew they caused these other fires in Santa Rosa and in Redding and in other places. And so they said, as a response to that, we're bringing arborists in. And they, you, when we were out there in our hotel rooms, we'd see APS with guys with the, the certified arborist patch on and, and they're talking to little children and stuff. And, and we're sending these arborists out. You know, certified arborists are coming through your neighborhoods, and we're going to make this a, a, you know, a great state and all this and that. And then, you know, three months into it, they abandoned the whole program and and shut it down because uh, obviously they couldn't afford. There was something like 20,000 tree jobs that we created with these polygons on this app on our phones because of all of the stuff that needed to come out along those power lines. So I think it was just a stunt that they started to do. And then, then they just kind of abandoned because they started cutting our hours back. First, we were, we were guaranteed, you know, 90 hours a week. You know, we were out there and, and a truck and a, a 5,000 calorie lunch every day that they put, they packed us and, uh, you know, all these promises of all this stuff. And then two weeks after we started, they started slowly taking away any of the things that all of the, took the lunch away. And then all of a sudden they started closing some of the base camps. Yeah. And then the next thing you know is we couldn't work Saturdays anymore. And then the next thing you know, you know, it was like, uh, you can work five days a week, but you can't work more than 10 hours each day. And I was just like, you know what? <laughs> you know, it's not even worth it. So I, I... Okay, Irv is back there again. Yeah, oh, right over on the corner of Forest, or I mean, uh, right by Walmart, the road going right down there to Walmart. Okay. And 87. Okay. On the southwest side there are trees up there ponderosas that are dead yeah now i have beautiful ponderosas in my yard and i'm very close to that those trees that are dead i know they have the bug because i live with it you talk yeah. about the bark beetle, bark beetle. yes bark the bark beetles yeah what do we have to do when uh, the owners were called and i was politely told to go to hell they don't care about taking them down. What can we do to get those trees out of there? I don't know, because that's a hazard. I mean, I know it's a hazard. Know, yeah, we we had to stand by those trees back in paradise, and we had to actually, you know, a dead tree was immediate uh, threat, you know, so they have to come out. Uh, it would really be a good idea for the town to either have their arborist, who works for the park and rec, Nelson, uh, or hire me as an arborist, and we need to have inspections. Go through these neighborhoods and inspect them and tag these, these properties, you know, and actually say, we have a certified arborist that works part-time for the town of Paisley, 
that is going and doing inspections, you know, for a certain number of hours per day, going through and marking and, and sending uh, like they do in Phoenix. Uh, Phoenix will send uh, a mandatory work order to your house that says you need to take this tree out. Huge Aleppo pines that are dead and that people don't want to do it because it's going to cost them a lot to get it taken out. But the city will send you a mandatory order that you have to have that removed. Yeah. So we should do that with Firewise and with dead trees. Yeah, the, the town has just hired a Firewise fuels manager. Fuel, fuels manager guy. Okay, so hopefully some of that will happen. However, the town still needs to have more teeth in its ability to regulate. Oh yeah, I, I absolutely. Some of that. Yeah. It's been going on in the newspaper now, that, that whole three, yeah. three article. And then the other problem we have is trying to cut a tree down can be a problem also in this town. They're not happy about you cutting trees down. Right, absolutely. So I always tell people just to call me because they trust me in the, in the planning department of the, you know, where you get the permits to take the trees out. Have anybody over there? Oh, Frank again. Me again. Hey, on the, uh, on the way going north on 87, as you leave Payson, you start to make that turn, I kind of like seven or eight dead trees. Oh yeah, there, there's Have you a seen whole, them? Yeah, yeah, I see them every time I go to the landfill. So what do we do about that? That's sure. Gary Roberts uh, for the uh, forestry, Department of Forestry. Uh, forestry. Yeah, because that's, that's uh, forest land right there. You mean you're talking north of Home Depot and yeah. west of the, the B-line? Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so if I, if I have a hedge against my porch or something like that, and there was a fire someplace, and you guys showed up, you'd sit there and watch my house burn because I have a hedge on my porch. Well, it wouldn't be me because I don't work I with don't fire department. Oh, okay. I wouldn't. Um, that's not what they're talking about. They're not talking about somebody has a hedge next to their house. They're talking about whether you firewise cleared your your thick areas of your property. If you don't have any thick areas, you have nothing to worry about. It's just someone who has neglected, who has thick, thick areas of brush on their property, and it's just like a, just like a nightmare, just like paradise, you know, the stuff I was seeing there. If you have that and you don't do anything about it, they can't risk their firefighters' lives to try to save a house that has a, a line of gunpowder running to it. And that's basically what it is by you taking the steps just to have it firewise cleared, they'll see that there's breaks in that gunpowder line and they can get up there and they can stamp it out, just to use an analogy. Okay. Well, I've got uh, a town council person here. I'd like to say this. I'm a pastor for the Payson Care Center. Okay. And it's right there by the hospital. And that's the filthiest neighborhood covered in junk cars, big tanks. I don't know what used to be in the tanks. Everybody's got piles and piles of firewood everywhere you look, and the city wouldn't going to do anything about it if I go down there and say, hey, can you get this cleaned up? Because I, I'm in that care center every week, two or three times a week, taking care of those people, yeah. you know, and they could be gone in a second. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know, because I actually treated all of your pines years ago when you had needle scale, uh, when the needle scale came through the Golden Frontier neighborhoods. Uh, I treated all of your trees there at the care center. So I know what you're talking about, and I know there's, uh, must be crystal meth users, uh, I don't know, but they tend to just hoard and pile up junk, and it's, it's very dangerous. That's something the city has to do. You know, to do I know that, you know, I know. I think you had a question. We need a program from the city council to, we could call it, beautify the fire wires your yard with the junk that's in it, you know? Yeah, Whatever. yeah. Okay, thank start, you. Start a checklist with every neighbor, every address. I'm not sure they want to go first. It doesn't matter. Oh, he only has three or four questions. Oh, that's it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I've, read, I've read some articles about the California fires over the last couple of years. Is there any differentiation between older homes and new development? And the implication was all the older homes were in an easy, defensible spaces, and now the population is just coming to California, building absolutely wherever they want to, whether it's defensible or not. So what was your question? Well, is that true? Um, I was only out there for three months, so, I, you know, 
I'm not sure. They're, they're doing a lot of building, but you know, there's still untold vast stretches of, of forest. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, some of the days we walked up and down power lines, the huge power lines, and we were, we're out in the middle of nowhere. I'm on the Feather River, and it's just unbelievable. It's beautiful, but there's there's so much land out there. It's just unbelievable. A lot of it's forest, you know, National Forest Service. Okay, so. I think we still got one more. Bill has a, Bill's the last one. Is there anybody else that wants to ask a question? We're gonna, you're you're going to close us out, Bill. I need to be last, so okay. Um, <laughs> I, you live in town, you read the Roundup? And you listen to King Lock occasionally? Yeah. Okay. I I've learned somewhere that uh, let me uh, get, uh, let me start uh, start again. Start, start again. Uh, several years ago, and I've been here since 2001. Um, the county, I believe, hired some people to chop down trees or cut them up and take them to a wood burning power plant someplace, and. Uh, then they didn't tell this guy that that work was a four-letter word. So he he had better things to do. So then after I think a year, they hired another group who also didn't realize work was a four-letter word. And then they they did nothing either. So this has been twice, I believe. And and my question is, is there, are they ever gonna find somebody who understands what work is and hire them to do the work that needs to be done, and uh, also either in the Roundup or the KMOG, I heard recently, read recently, heard recently, that there is something happening in, around here that may utilize some of that old wood. Anybody know what that is? I can't it's remember. Choya Power Plant. Choya. Okay. Anyway, that's, so your that's encouraging. Yeah. From yes. Thank you. All right, so I don't know how you want to do it, but I have these brochures, and I'd like everybody at least to come up and, if they want a brochure, grab it, and I have business cards here on the end. Well, we're going to close our meeting first. Okay, we'll do that. Excellent. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Dave, you will be happy to know that there are several of us Tea Party folks that are on the Patient Firewise Committee. Barbara is one of them. Jim is our liaison to the town Great council. Job. And then our past president, Darlene, is on it. And we've got about seven people. And we, we are getting trained. Some of us are already trained. But others of, of us are going to be trained to go out and do assessments. Oh, so like 4th of July, we'll have a booth. We go up to the Home Depot for their outreach. And we give literature to people. We sign up to do free assessments on their homes. We wrote a really good ordinance last year. Well, actually, May of 2017 that got shot down. And the reason was because it was complaint driven and the real estate people are going, oh my gosh, if any of our buyers find out that we have this tree ordinance and the seller's yard is covered with trees, they're going to make that seller Firewise the property as a consent of the sale and so they didn't like it and they convinced everybody to vote the thing down because it is complaint driven and there's no teeth otherwise it's a beautiful little place you know because they mandatory they'll slap a, a, a thing on your property and I get calls from people oh, my, they just told me I have 30 days to firewise my place you know so they're they're doing in a microcosm what we should be doing in patients, you know. And also, just to mention, Frank here is the one that saw me uh, give this same talk for the Wood Hill Homeowners Association. If any of you are connected to any other homeowners associations here, please let them know that there's a certified arborist in town who does Firewise, who is willing to come and speak about Firewise to their homeowners associations. Also, any events that are going on, we have a huge banner, Natural Beauty Firewising Works banner, uh, and then all these brochures, so we're willing to come uh, free to speak to anybody and to set up a booth at any event. So You should set up a booth next to us at the uh, 4th of July. I would. This year, Sarah and I will be in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, where I grew, uh, up, where I grew up. 
So we're having some of that great chowder that I grew up with. <laughs> okay, so if anybody wants to see a firewise big lot versus a non firewise big lot, come up to my house and I will introduce you to the lot just to the north of me and the one behind it. The one right next to me, we firewised. The one behind has never been touched. It's a 100 by 200 lot.